is rustic yarn? Rustic. Rustic. Rust. Tick. Tick. Rustle, rustle, rustle. Tick. Rustic. Rustic. What is rustic yarn? But what is rustic yarn? the Crimson Stitchery, a video channel about making all things beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka and you can find relevant links for this video in the down bar here below on YouTube. Rustic yarn has swept across the far corners of the knitting interwebs over the last five years or so, creeping in from fields and mountains and pushing aside the even uniform identical yarns of department stores of yore. It has invaded stashes far and wide. But what exactly is it? In this video I'll be exploring the concept of rustic yarn. How can you tell what it is? What makes it so special? What's it good for? What's all the fuss about? I'll also share my experience of just a couple of projects that I have used rustic yarns for and don't worry I'll be explaining why it seems to be that I can't help using these bunny ear air quotes when I talk about rustic yarns. <laughs> So the big question, what really is rustic yarn? And what's all the fuss about? And why am I making a whole video about it for you? At its core, when knitters are referring to something called rustic yarn, it's referencing wool and spun pure wool yarns that have not been superwash treated, so they're not machine washable. Additionally, rustic yarns might be undyed, so they might feature the varying different colours of different sheep breeds and their fleeces, or if they have dyed, it might be that the yarn was actually unbleached so it hadn't been treated to have a kind of uniform across the board sense of colour. The natural variegations in colours between sheep's wools, especially if the yarn itself is a blend of different breeds, can allow lots of different tones to come through in the dyeing process and allow these kinds of yarns to have a really amazing and rich depth of colour. But it's the technical composition of the yarn that is key when it comes to defining rustic yarns, as well as the fibres themselves. The yarns could be single ply or they could be two ply or three ply but most importantly is that the yarns will be woolen spun. When we say that a yarn is woolen spun this is referring to a fibre production process whereby prior to all of the spinning the wool fibres have not been combed flat. So they're kind of just like this mash of hair, <laughs> sheep's hair, wool, um, that is just kind of spun all together spun when all of the fibres are sticking out in all sorts of different directions when it's still very very fluffy and this produces a very very hairy finished product. Since the fibres are still sticking out everywhere they actually end up trapping quite a lot of warmth which means that woolen spun yarns can be very very warm and toasty whilst still being very very light. The opposite to woolen spun yarn is worsted spun. This is when all of the fibres are combed together so that they're all lying flat in the same direction, just like I might comb my hair before I plait it. So then when that is spun, all of the yarns have a very even and uniform texture. It's very flat, it's quite a sophisticated kind of texture overall. Um, it's you know more associated with formal wear in that sense, Worsted spun yarns are the kind of yarns that will be, you know, when they're spun very, very tightly, um, this is the kind of yarn that will then be woven into cloth. You might have heard of worsted cloth as well. But just note that when it comes to textile production processes, a lot of the same words can mean quite different concepts when used in different contexts. So worsted spun yarn is not the same as worsted weight yarn, which refers to the overall thickness when sold for hand knitting, especially it's a thickness that's available on the American market, a little bit more commonly than in the British or European markets, though you can find it here as well. So worsted spun, worsted weight and woolen spun which is what we're concerned with in this video today. What makes rustic yarn so special? 
So the characteristic, as I said, is this hairiness and the idea that the fibres on the surface are standing out and reaching into space. This allows it to trap a lot of warm air, especially when worn on the body. The fact that there's so much space physically present within the yarn means also that it's got a very, it's got a very interesting texture because um, you can compact the yarn down by pressing the yarn down, in other words by knitting or crocheting it much more tightly, that will squeeze it together and produce a dense fabric or conversely you can work with the airiness and the loftiness inherent in the yarn you can knit or crochet on a much larger needles and much looser gauge and it will actually you know it will cope with that just fine because of all of this surface hair and texture it will kind of just spread out its arms a lot more and fill that space and just produce quite a different effect so it's really quite amazingly versatile it's also really, really excellent for doing stranded colour work with. So what I've just been talking about, the kind of fibres of the hair going out into space and, you know, spreading out. When you're doing colour work, when you're using two or even three yarns at once, um, this has got an additional really, really useful and helpful effect, which is that the actual fibres on the surface of the two different yarns cling together. They actively want to come together, which means that when you're doing your yarn management, when you're knitting colour work, it just makes it so much easier because the knitting just actually wants to come together because of its composition, as opposed to the worsted spun yarns, which, you know, are very smooth and very slick. And, you know, you might be able to get them to gel together quite nicely, but they could just kind of slide off each other equally. So certainly about 10 years ago, at least in the UK, at least in, in Greater London where I'm from, it was pretty uncommon to find woolen spun yarns commercially available in like department stores and stuff like that. You could only find the very smooth and slick worsted spun yarns. And um, when I first tried doing colour work with those yarns, it was just so difficult. And the first colour work project that I actually did successfully, really successfully, was this pair of mittens. It's the underwing mitt and I did this using Shetland two ply yarn and it's this is honestly the most difficult project that I've ever done and it was successful purely due to the yarn choice so it kind of just makes these projects possible the fact that it's got this kind of airy hairy texture means that it's also quite fuzzy right so the edges when it comes to color work aren't necessarily that crisply defined. Um, they can be, obviously depends on you know many, many other technical factors, but just this idea of the yarns kind of kind of coming together and blending together can also be used to great effect when it comes to blending colours in yarns. And if you think about um, those kind of really complicated fair isle striped, um, striped and stranded colour work, vests and sweaters and so on, even though what kind of stands out, you know, when you're standing at a distance, what stands out is the colour work of like the, the larger motifs and the shapes, but actually the background colours often blend together very, very subtly and kind of merge and emerge through in different kinds of colours and that's really down to this woolen spun quality just facilitating that effect. It's a very very painterly effect and it's really worth if you ever have the opportunity getting really really up close to that kind of knitting so that you can really really study and appreciate it. Best examined in detail. So in colour work, not only does the yarn grab together very easily and blend together very nicely in terms of the colours potentially, the lightness inherent in woolen spun yarn also means that the finished garment is going to be very, very light, which when it comes to colour work means that when you're working with, you know, many, many strands of yarn and you're carrying the strands of yarn behind the work, you know, it doesn't add too much heaviness or too much bulk. So again, you can get the maximum warmth with as much lightness, you know, physical lightness in terms of the weight as possible. Why is it so expensive? Now this is a really really complicated issue that I'm not going to be able to adequately address but I just want to give you you know an idea. Um, rustic yarn has become very very popular in the last five years and as such it can often come across as some kind of luxury product like some kind of luxury gourmet yarn because it can be very difficult to get hold of. It can feel like all of the coolest kids are using it and it can, yeah, it can, it can be very expensive. Obviously, you know, what is considered cheap and what is considered expensive is deeply personal to everybody's 
budget. But when it comes to any kind of product that is created in a very, very small batch, economies of scale come into play straight away. And that is what is affecting the price. Basically, anything that is mass produced, you know, created not in the quantities of thousands or tens of thousands, but like hundreds of thousands and millions, is going to be sold to you, the consumer, at a much cheaper price. That's because at the manufacturing level, when brands are negotiating with suppliers, with manufacturers, with factories, with warehouses and all of the rest of it, they're working with such large volumes of orders, which means that they are therefore able to leverage that and negotiate much better prices for themselves, which means that when you then divide it up to the cost per unit, that becomes much smaller. So the cost per unit is much smaller because they're offering up these huge contracts overall that are just still like millions of pounds and dollars like so much more money and that's because it's all just scaled up and one of the reasons why it can be cheaper to produce things on a larger volume is because a lot of the costs when it comes into creating a product come through the setup costs right through the design of the product through the testing um through the development, the communication, like setting up the right kind of injection mold for the right kind of shape or, you know, kind of tweaking, resetting a piece of machinery so that it operates in a certain manner. So all, you've got all of those setup costs to bear in mind. And then when it comes to then making the product, you know, you can make one quantity, but it's not going to cost you that much more to just make a whole nother batch when you've already got the whole system set up. So as I said, this is a really, really simplified um, way of looking at it, but I hope that it can just introduce you to the idea of economies of scale when it comes to production of consumer goods, any kind of consumer goods. Obviously we're talking about yarn in this case, but it's quite easy to compare it to, you know, fashion items, clothing or homewares and, and other things like that, which are still textiles at the end of the day. So when we look at products that are coming from much smaller producers, whether that's a small brand or an independent brand that isn't part of a larger, you know, group or conglomerate of other brands, you know, under some kind of umbrella, um, or if it's actually a small farm, right? So actually a really small company in itself where the company are actually the producers of the material as well, you know, you can understand how they're dealing in much smaller volumes overall and they don't have the same kind of negotiation power. And I think it's really important to keep putting these kind of things in context of the economy in general. And I think it can really help us to understand, you know, why it is that certain things are priced in certain ways and just try and understand, you know, try and understand that and that puts us in a, in a really strong position as a consumer too. So when you are buying yarns from a smaller company, from a smaller producer, you're also investing much more directly into that company. Um, and it can be a really interesting way of communicating with companies that share your values. A lot of the time when you buy things that are mass produced from large chains, what you might be paying for is actually the marketing and branding and not necessarily the actual product itself. And when it comes to yarn production, what has become the norm is that yarns are, for example, bleached, right? They are dyed using a certain type of chemical dye or they are produced to a certain weight or a certain spec. And if you want to produce something slightly different, maybe it's a bit more experimental, maybe it's with a, you know, different sheep breed or you, you're you working with a sheep that has a really amazing type of fleece and you want to try and preserve that, you know, not kind of bleach and stamp all of that out of it, you're using a slightly different process, whereas industry at mass has not been set up to handle that. So because of that, you know, that's another reason why you might be working with even smaller batches, which will then mean that ultimately, you know, the cost per unit is going to be higher when it comes to retail to the consumer. As I said, this is super, super simplified, but it's just a few ideas around the reasons why rustic yarns and kind of natural products or less processed products can be a lot more expensive than commercially available mass produced products. And that applies to clothing, that applies to food and other kind of consumer goods in general. Why is it so cheap? Cheap? Yes, I really do mean the word cheap. <laughs>
even though I've just been talking about things being quite expensive and quite pricey I do think that when it comes to rustic yarns there is the opportunity to move away from the luxury organic deli in Whole Foods and Harrods food hall if we if we get away from a sense of luxury and look at yarns that are a bit more stalwart shall we say have longevity even old-fashioned i really genuinely think that there is the opportunity to purchase rustic yarns in a way that is much more budget friendly and how do you do this well you've got to look for basically brands that have been producing a type of yarn for a really long time especially in northern europe right so places where knitting has you know kind of stayed part of the economy like in the shetland isles where you know knitting and wool production is a really important important part of the local economy or just other countries that you know that have yarn brands where knitting never really went away out of their culture so for example in the uk you know knitting is still seen as quite a niche hobby quite old-fashioned you know people might think that it's cool and unusual but you, you'd get just as many comments if you were like knitting out in public about like people's grandmothers and this that and the other and i'm like my grandma didn't even do knitting she hasn't got the patience <laughs> i knit things for my grandma but there's still very much this public perception like not helped at all by really lazy journalism and kind of tropes that are just repeated in culture but it's not like this everywhere and I know that, you know, in Scandinavian countries like Sweden or in Norway, um, knitting hasn't kind of ebbed and flowed like in quite the same dramatic way that it has done elsewhere. So, you know, if you don't live in those countries, you can try and look at ways of purchasing their yarns <laughs> because like the likelihood is that actually these kind of rustic yarns aren't, you know, weird and aren't luxury unusual products but actually might be things that are still in production quite commonly. Yarn brands that I've worked with are the Shetland yarn companies, Jameson and Smith, Jameson and Shetland. I've also worked with yarns from the Norwegian brand Rauma, especially PT2 and Finul. And on this channel before, I've also recommended a Danish yarn brand called Holst Supersoft, which in a nutshell is really cheap because they don't kind of finish all of the production process before they sell it to you. So you have to actually wash out part of the yarn yourself. And then, you know, that's just a kind of cost cutting measure there. You can also look for any kind of yarn that you can get direct from a mill. So direct from the manufacturer, from the factory, bypassing the middleman of the retail outlet and just getting it straight from mill shop. Sometimes you can get stuff like this from eBay, secondhand sites. You can also look at cones of wool that are supplied for machine knitting although this is um kind of a different slightly different though parallel world because they've got their own system of yarn weights that you do have to figure out but you might get lucky um you can try and buy wool in bulk so for instance i think that one of the jamieson shetland brands does sell their yarn on bulk on a cone sometimes they have special offers and it works out again much cheaper when it comes to like the smaller units when you buy it in bulk for the same kind of reasons that I explored before. Now, as I said, the idea of cheapness is highly relative. And when you're making comparisons between different yarns, different brands, you know, different products, I would really, really encourage you to always make a comparison across fiber. So always compare wool with wool and this type of wool with, you know, a similar type of wool. So like super, one type of super wash, wash merino with another type of super wash merino, or when it comes to Shetland wools or whatever. But don't compare across fibers and especially try why not to compare wool to acrylic because they might both look like yarn but they are not the same product at all wool comes from a sheep it comes from sheep that were alive are alive it comes from farmers from people who have to manage the sheep who have to cut the sheep shear them drive the wool to the wool selling place collect it like it's all really kind of physical and tangible but acrylic and other synthetic fibers including nylon um or polyamide or polyester or you know acetate or whatever it is these are 
synthetics, that means that they come from the oil industry, that means that they are, you know, a type of plastic, type of polymer, and that means that they come from the bones of long dead dinosaurs who don't have a say in the matter, and we don't seem to be concerned with the well-being and livelihood of said dinosaurs anymore. <laughs> so, obviously it's gonna be cheaper. It's just a completely different product. So I have had comments from viewers before who've said that they've explored some of the yarns that I've talked about, um, but even when they looked at Holster, that they thought that that was too expensive for them. And I think that this is down to having unrealistic expectations of what the cost of fibre should be. I uh, I know that I am an idealist, I would love everybody to be paid adequately for the labour that they put into producing things, but obviously when it comes to supply chains, as I've said, things are really, really complicated and there are just, you know, so many steps to go through and so many people. But personally, I try to really embrace the idea of trying to buy a little bit less, trying to buy things that are maybe a little bit higher quality, possibly, or, you know, if they're more expensive, that I know that my money is able in some way to support a smaller business where the, you know, the impact of that money can be, you know, seen more directly. Also, smaller businesses tend to pay tax more than larger businesses that tend to have really, really excellent accountants who find loopholes. But again, <laughs> you know, it's really interesting how when it just comes to something as seemingly simple as domestic crafts, like hobbies and knitting, that actually we are, we are immediately tapping into these huge global supply chains and these, you know, actually really enormous economic principles that are really grounding other areas of our life. It's something that I personally really enjoy exploring and I hope that you find it interesting too. Now that we've covered, you know, what rustic yarn is, what are its properties, what is it good for, you know, where can you find it at different price points, let's tackle why it is that I always start laughing when I say the word rustic yarn and why I'm using these stupid little air quotes? It's just because when I hear a word and then I notice that it's really popular and I start hearing it everywhere, it just makes me laugh. It just makes me laugh so much because it starts to feel like the word loses its meaning and I really do feel like rustic yarn has become so, so popular to even like entirely dominate like the visual identity of some other YouTube channels or podcasters or whatever. And I'm gonna just say hands down that I do honestly, I think it's really beautiful. I like the idea of things being, you know, natural to have like that link to nature and the natural natural world, that's actually something that's really, really important to me. But just when you start to see it everywhere, it just makes me laugh. So does anyone else have that same kind of reaction? Let me know your thoughts and feelings in the comments down below. So I've got to say, when I talk about kind of words losing, losing their meaning when they are repeated too much, it's also because I think the word rustic, it's just an adjective, like it's a feeling, it's a mood, and it doesn't really have any specific meanings within itself. If we are looking for a, you know, a technical description of rustic yarn, we would say unbleached woolen spun pure wool yarns, right? But instead you've kind of got this, you know, rustic, rustic yarn <laughs> thing going on. Um, I just can't stop laughing. I think laughter is really healthy. <laughs> And, you know, I try not to take things too seriously, so I hope that you can appreciate that. And all rustic yarn lovers, I hope that you're not offended in any way by me and that, you know, we can all just take this in, in good spirit and in good fun that it's meant to be in. But when it comes to words like the word rustic, to me, it's also kind of like saying something like natural food or world music, which you know, world music really annoys me because music comes from the world. And food, I hope that it's natural because if it was unnatural, it might make me ill. 
<laughs> but I think that the word rustic is kind of like a marketing word, right? Because evocative, it's, you know, very affective, it brings out feelings, it conjures up this imagery of a bucolic lifestyle where one can walk through the woods in comfortable muddy boots and not have wet feet somehow and not twist our ankle and, you know, carry baskets and pluck an apple from the tree. And I do like plucking apples from a tree, let's just, you know. Let's be, I'm really into foraging. Um, but at the same time, I do not live in the woods. I live in a kind of normal suburban neighborhood, which in outer London means terraced houses. And I'm very fortunate I have a ground floor flat, which means I have a garden. But many people around me, many of my friends and peers do not. Um, especially, you know, I live in the outer city, especially people that live more in the inner city. There's even less access to green spaces, which to me is actually a real tragedy. And so my interpretation of the popularity of rustic yarns really has to do with the urban and actually suburban environments that we find ourselves living in. It's the genuine reality of the concrete jungle where everything, you know, is determined by car usage and actually just basic things like crossing main roads can be really, really difficult. And so there's a sort of this fantasy of being out in the woods and walking around and like just be able to walk places and to get places and like to have access to you know sheep that can produce your clothing the aforementioned apple from the tree in local you know local vicinity it's just so seductive and you know if you're lucky enough to live in a rural area then amazing like good for you personally I do not like leaving urban areas because as an ethnic minority, it often makes me feel very uncomfortable and no joke, people, I've been told about what great English I speak. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just let's leave that at that. Anyway, <laughs> so just the whole idea of rustic yarn, sort of this rural fantasy to me, which um, brings me to my next point. Doesn't this sound like the 1970s? Well, yeah, I mean, when it comes to wool that is, you know, rustic, what also comes with it is the idea of it being slightly scratchy. And these kind of woolen spun yarns, especially when they are not from merino wool fibres, so when they are from other kind of breeds, maybe like heritage breeds or whatever, you know, sometimes it's not that soft. Especially the kind of the prickly nature of the surface of the yarn can be kind of tickly and hairy. And then when yarns are superwash treated, that basically means that the natural fiber of wool has been stripped of its scales. So, you know, fibers will have scales and that's the kind of clinginess that I was talking about. Um, but yeah, superwash yarns don't have that anymore, which means that as they're very, very smooth, um, they're actually a little bit softer. So the rustic yarns that have not been superwash treated are, you know, potentially a little bit prickly. Doesn't this sound like the 1970s? Yes, I think it does sound like the 1970s, especially when it comes to all of the undyed, you know, undyed greys, you know, uh, so, many, so much grey. <laughs> um, and also in the 1970s, I think we had a, quite a comparable movement to today. There was a growing environmental movement, you know, growth of vegetarianism as a lifestyle kind of choice and as an ethical, personal ethical choice. Um, also a huge resurgence in handicrafts, especially crochet, but also knitting. So I mentioned earlier that my grandmother doesn't knit. But, you know, she did it in the 70s, but she doesn't have, pa you know, she doesn't have patience for it now. So she, she sort of did it when it was trendy. Um, and, you know, just other aspects, like I don't know if anyone here has watched the TV show The Good Life. It's it's really hilarious. It's about like a suburban neighbourhood. And on the one hand, you have like a Thatcherite couple who are like yuppies and like really rich and everything's really prim and proper. And then you've got like The Good Life, which is like the beautiful Felicity Kendall. Um, and they're like, they've got like chickens and pigs or something like that. And, and they're like making pottery cups and stuff. I mean, like we totally into that, like me and my partner. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I do think in a way it's quite, you know, nostalgic in that sense of kind of retrospectively looking at idealised visions of the past. And yet, you know, in the context of the present where actually we've got less and less access to that and less and less access to green spaces. But we can experience that through the joy of rustic yarns.
So that's everything from me today. Drop me a comment down below and let me know what you think of this video. Do you agree with my interpretation of the current popularity of rustic yarns? Gotta say that I am speaking as a fashion historian, as Technically, I do have a master's degree in history of fashion. Um, so I find it really, really interesting to think about trends and kind of cultural tendencies and what does, you know, one moment where something becomes really, really popular, what does that signify about the rest of the kind of culture and society that we're living in? You know, what values are kind of being embedded through our choices and through our desires, you know, as consumers or really just as everyday people, as opposed to the kind of elites and people in power who tend to become part of the historical record. I also have a monthly newsletter, Postcards from the Crimson Stitchery, which I recommend if you like these kind of thoughts and witticisms that I share, I recommend subscribing to that as you'll get a lot more of that in your inbox. And finally, I'd like to give a shout out to all of my wonderful patrons over on Patreon, as well as anyone that has supported the Crimson Stitchery by buying me a coffee over on Ko-fi. Thank you so much for your support. You are making it possible for me to create videos like this and host discussions. If you like the idea of getting a little bit more involved in the Crimson Stitchery and finding more like-minded people with whom you can talk about things in a kind of safe space online, um, and yeah, just kind of make some friends, then you might consider supporting me over on Patreon too, because your contributions are going seriously a really, really long way to keeping my Crimson endeavours going. So thank you so much. If you've enjoyed this video, please do hit thumbs up down below and leave me a comment. Subscribe to The Crimson Stitchery for more videos just like this. I have vlogs, I have tutorials, I have talk-torials where I witter on and let me know how you're doing.